Hello everyone, I hope that you can hear us, see us. Uh, very warm welcome to our Womanize Inspiring Stories. So my name is Masha Camino and I have the honor to present you uh, the interview today and be your host for today. So thank you very much for joining on our second Womanize Inspiring Stories on Twitch live right here. And before we getting started, I would like to, you know, talk briefly about the history of Womanize and to jump back a little bit in time and tell you more about the initiative in general. So, um, and of course, if you peeps have any questions at any time, just feel free to put them in the chat. We have great moderators and people looking at that as well and then bringing them to our attention. So feel free to ask anything. Um, yeah, but so in general, Womenize was founded back in 2015 by Mike Liebe, um, who is the CEO of Booster Space and the founder of Games Week Berlin, as well as Ruth Lemon, who is a consultant and specializes in funding, career development, as well as event and project management. Um, yeah, and since then, Womenize has been held as an event format, mainly uh, within Games Week Berlin, but also independently in Cologne, which was really cool. It was a great event, actually. And in addition, Womanize even made it to uh, South um, America, Latin America, where two editions were held so far by our co-workers, which is really cool. And it usually offers uh, conference content such as exciting keynotes, interesting talks, insightful workshops, as well as networking opportunities by people that are rather not so represented on stage. And this is always something that we want to highlight, bring people on stage that have some great knowledge and should really share those with others. Um, yeah, and the goal of the initiative <laughs> is very cute, but it's actually um, that Womanize is no longer needed one day because the inequity um, is not an issue anymore and the inequality as well. But there is still such a long way to go in the games industry. But until then, Womanize will continue to grow, bring people together, raise awareness and provide a stage for inspiring people such as we have with us today. And uh, Womanize Inspiring Stories is a weekly series that features exciting people from all around the industry and it usually comes out on Wednesday. Uh, but if you want, so today is a very special day. And if you want to find out more um, information in general about Womanize or the weeklies, then you can follow us on social media and also check out our websites to find more information in general. But yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to talk anymore because today we have a guest with us who lives in Switzerland, has a master's degree in game design, and is also working on an election app. I'm speaking about Sophie Walker. So welcome, Sophie. Super glad to have you here with me today. And yeah, for all the people that don't know you yet, maybe you could introduce yourself. I would love that. Yeah, so hi, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sophie Walker. I'm a game researcher at the Zurich University of the Arts. And in 2020, I founded a serious game and gamification spin off Miralox Creations. And we use playful approaches to solve problems That's of society cool. and the world and everyone who has problems. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it sounds super interesting and I'm sure that not many people are super familiar with like the work that you're doing. But you were also mentioning that you uh, have a degree and you also wrote a master thesis, which was called Project CH Plus Minus uh, Games for Democracy. Can you maybe tell us what that was about and what was the focus on that mainly? Yeah, um, Project CH Plus is really about using playful approaches to familiarize people with their democratic rights mm -hmm. because democracy is pretty awesome. I think at least a, a lot of people I think that as well. Cool. <laughs> but sometimes um, people get overwhelmed with the available, like the amount of candidates that they have to choose from. In Switzerland, we have referendums. So mm -hmm. the people get to vote on specific legislation. We get to say yes or no. And uh, if you're not familiar with the topic, you can get a bit lost. Mm -hmm. And for many people that started to feel like a burden because, oh my God, there's another election. I have to read this booklet again. It's all on paper. And um, I was thinking it's time and it's necessary to spark joy again. So it's not supposed to be a burden when you can vote for someone or for or against a topic. You're supposed to feel empowered. You're mm. supposed to um, enjoy the process of choosing and games are very good at making people enjoy the process of choosing how That's to true. act. 
And so um, that's where the entire thought process came from. If we can make people as excited about their democratic rights as they are about, I don't know, playing Candy Crush, <laughs> then um, maybe we can mobilize some voters that usually wouldn't vote. Yeah. So we want to spark fascination for democracy. Yeah, okay, I can totally see that. I mean, I've seen it so many times when the vote comes up, right? And people are not really ready yet to decide and then they don't choose at all in the end. Then they don't go yeah. for vote and their voice just is not heard in the end. I think it's also interesting because it really goes into the direction of more accessibility, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. For people that have a smartphone, a home, or have the opportunity to look something up online as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like to go more into that direction, what do you think is the strength of conveying knowledge in a playful way? You touched upon it a little bit already, but maybe you can go a little bit more in detail here. Yeah. Um, so I am into educational games like big time. Yeah. Because playful learning, it's in our nature. Like mammals do it, like baby bears are playing, whatever. Mammals play in order to learn survival skills mm -hmm. and humans actually do the same. So we learn a lot of new stuff by experimenting and by playfully testing boundaries, risky behavior, stuff like that in a safe environment. Like we play with people that we trust. Yeah. Um, or like in a safe environment with some safety gear measures in place. And um, it's in our nature. So that's the first thing I love about it. And the second thing is it's really low access because with the playful approach people are not scared to make mistakes yeah right? because it's just a game so i don't care you could even use it as an excuse yeah i was really bad at that math problem but it was just a game so i didn't even try <laughs> so it gives people the opportunity to experiment and discover on their own pace and that takes the pressure away yeah well. absolutely yeah. yeah i love that yeah, that sounds that sounds really good, and I can also understand that quite a lot. Yeah, um, and I'm sure because you talked about Switzerland a little bit, but is it that your app that you're focusing on right now is that also focused on Switzerland specifically at the moment? Yeah. So right now we have two applications. Mm -hmm. One of them is a gamification. It's called CH Plus App, and the other one is a serious game. It's called Dope Elections, and they are explicitly. Um, voting support tools. So during cantonal elections, you get to choose which candidates you want to vote for. And in the CH Plus app, that kind of works like Tinder for elections. So you mm -hmm. really, you make your profile, we get the political data from external partners, and then you swipe through them, really like hot or not, and then you can drag and drop them onto specific lists that you think are cool. So that's the one uh, concept that we have. And the other one, Dope Elections, we were inspired by uh, Fall Guys. Oh. So you have the candidates in a race, and it's the, the real candidates with their pictures and oh the party cool. colors and a big racetrack. And then you answer a questionnaire, mm -hmm. like, are you for uh, renewable energy sources? You say yes or no, or maybe. And then the candidates who agree with you are in the front of the race. And the ones who disagree, like, they get expelled in very glamorous ways. <laughs> So yeah, we're really um, targeting Switzerland with this mm -hmm. and we're actually building these election aids from a cantonal level. So Switzerland has many cantons and they have elections all the time, <laughs> all year around. That's really beautiful because that allows us to test different features in every canton. Yeah. And we do that because we actively involve people in creating the, the voting apps mm -hmm. because we believe that if you do something well, for democracy, obviously, you need to involve people in it. Um, but in general, if you, if you design something, you need user feedback. But that's even more so, sure. it's like democracy relevant. You need to ask people, what do you want? What are your issues? How can we support you? Yeah. Maybe it's also interesting because then after a while, then people will also, you know, be more engaged in general in the yeah. election, right? When they know more about yeah. it and they have the barrier, which is way lower than for them uh, to participate more actively, which could be super interesting. I would love to see how it like influences the elections in the long run, right? Since when are you developing this app? Yeah, um, it all started in 2019. <laughs> so that's, yeah, let me, let me lean back <laughs> for that. That was the last federal elections mm -hmm. and there it all started with surveys. So I literally asked them, hello, everybody, <laughs> it's elections now. Um, look at all these posters with people and their slogans. Uh, 
do you know like what this is all about? Do mm -hmm. you have any problems with your decision making? And then I sent out surveys. And from these surveys, we created, I, I created the first concept for the CH Plus app. And since then, we've cantonally involved people in testing these features, suggesting new features, and um, it's been quite a ride. Yeah, yeah. it sounds <laughs> like that. But maybe we can go a couple of steps backwards because now I talked to you about your app and we've heard about your company just a little bit, but maybe you can tell us about your, your story to hello neighbors, uh, to getting to that company. So um, I've heard that you've grown up and lived in a variety of different countries. And uh, I was wondering, how did that experience impact uh, your journey and your academic work? Was that also something that led up to building your own company? Um, yes, so I have grown up moving around every four years. So I was in Germany, Switzerland, Indonesia, Egypt, the Netherlands. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so you travel around a bit. I traveled around quite a bit and I saw a lot of different cultures and a lot of different things of what is perceived as normal. Mm -hmm. And I love that because normal is something else everywhere. <laughs> There's n nothing that's normal. And in that sense, um, I think just a deep respect for culture mm -hmm. and people in general. So I always knew that I wanted to do something that supports people like good people honest people stuff like that because there's also a lot of bad people out there um, and when I decided to do game design because I just enjoyed games like many people who study game design they just like playing games nothing wrong with that right um, but I always knew I wanted to do more or something else than just just mm -hmm. entertainment games there is obviously a big place for entertainment games they're cool they they help us be inspired and live some some fantasies mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted to do something that also conveys knowledge yeah. skills whatever and um, yeah I think educational games can can do that yeah so by living in different countries and yet all these different experiences you were then led to the point after a master thesis where you were like I want to start my own thing is that what happened or um, so I did my bachelor in game design and development in the Netherlands. Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, and there I didn't know that before I uh, before I started there. They had a focus on educational games. And I was like, yeah, see, okay, nice surprise. Um, in the Netherlands, the gaming industry was quite competitive. So there's like guerrilla games and some other studios, not too many big ones. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like. I might check what it's like back at home. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see what the Swiss games industry was up to. I knew that I wanted to do educational games and there actually is not that much happening yet mm -hmm. in Switzerland. We have Cobalt games, they're really cool. Um, we have Sphere, they do like Exer games, which is awesome. It's like mixing VR, AR with exercise. It's really, really oh, cool. Oh, wow, that yeah. sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah, there's cool stuff going That's on really cool. there. Yeah. But, um, so I decided to do my master's in Switzerland and uh, that was really cool because there the whole democracy app thing started. Yeah. Ah, okay, interesting. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your studio now. Like you are not alone in your studio, but you have your colleagues as well now. How did you all build this up? <laughs> um, a lot of hard work and a little <laughs> bit of magic and a little bit of money, actually. And a little yeah. bit of luck, maybe as well. A <laughs> little bit of luck, for sure, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're four people in mm -hmm. total at the moment, all part-time, because sometimes uh, you need some security when you're a spin-off, right? Yes. Um, and we work together two days a week, like full team together. And other than that, we're like um, flexible mm -hmm. with the working time. And um, at the moment, this whole Corona thing actually really helped because we have one developer who's in Lausanne, that's the French part of Switzerland. Oh yeah. And she always zooms in and with the others, we sometimes work at the office, but usually we do a lot of remote sessions at the moment. Nice. Yeah. And um, we pull our weight. <laughs> we give everything and uh, 
try to achieve something awesome together, I think it's important to play to your strengths. That's yeah. definitely very important. Also know what you're good at and what yeah. you're comfortable in and what you want to explore as yeah. well in the sure. new fields. What is your role in the company? What would you describe yourself as? I mean, in such small teams, it's always a little bit hard because everyone wears multiple hats, right? But yeah. what is maybe a term that you would use to describe yourself as most? Um, manager and designer. Yeah. Yeah, because it all started with my uh, master's projects so or our main um, thing that we're doing is still devoting applications and um, because that is very topic specific with democracy and Swiss democratic system and stuff like that um, I do the design for the applications mm -hmm. of course we always check in with each other to see like does the entire team like this yeah um, but yeah definitely most of the design and then the administrative work that's always great joy <laughs> to do that I the know. bookkeeping and all of that uh, fundraising that's a really big part of it especially when you're starting out um yeah and supporting supporting the crew i guess yeah yes. that's that's actually a but big this part. is a very important yeah important part as well and how would you also um say are good ways of keeping the team together especially especially as such a small team when you're saying some parts are chiming in remote and some are local like, how would you say are a few practices that work out great for your team? Do you have some? Um, I think it's important that we all, as I mentioned before, you play to each other's strengths. And yeah. you give everybody in the team the opportunity to grow. That's something that's really important to me personally as well. Um, other than that, we are... Um, working on something with the goal to support our society, to support young people in Switzerland who don't know who to vote for. And this is very motivating for the team that we try to um, help and yeah. support. Yeah. Maybe um, actually regarding to that, we got a question by Moon Maths. So how do you build up engagement and motivation for people to interact with complex political topics? Yeah, so the important thing there is to always be straightforward mm -hmm. with people and to always um, show that this is explicitly gamified. Otherwise, it becomes very, I don't know, like, why is this? Why are you adding game mechanics to politics? So we always have to be um, uh, careful to communicate. This is about motivating you to learn more. So yeah. we're always... Um, trying to inspire people to interact with political content, mm -hmm. like to look up a candidate. And one thing that we pay a lot of attention to is to make them feel empowered. So we give them a lot of small decisions that they can make. They can, um, for example, when they are using the CH Plus app, they can swipe through the candidates. They always have the, the power to say, I want you, I don't want you. Yeah. Afterwards, they can do a ranking. You, I want you on spot number one, I want you on spot number five. So we're always um, trying to give users, players, a feeling of being in power mm -hmm. and really making decisions almost at all times when they're using the, the applications. So it's basically always clear, this is connected to an actual topic, yeah. this is something that is in the real world happening and yeah. we want to inform you about it through this application. Yes, and you can decide, like there's you're not just in front of a piece of paper and you read it and you're like, what? Yeah. But you can actively structure your thoughts as you go along. Yeah. That's super interesting. I think that's also one um, mechanic that is also used in entertainment games, correct? So um, maybe what are some, um, some usages and some things that you see from entertainment games that are applicable to your own, uh, your own serious games? Are there practices that you both use? I think a big concept is that the more time you invest in something, the more dear it becomes to you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing we're actually uh, actively trying to do in both applications. We just want them to spend time with the candidates. Yeah. Because then after a while, when they try to figure out the perfect team for them, um, the idea is that they will have spent so much time being like, yeah, but... Um, you are a bit more green than the other person, so you should be on the list, even though you are a bit, like, I disagree with you more on that other topic there. Mm -hmm. um, that 
they will be more motivated to vote because they already invested so much time in going through the candidates and building their own perfect dream team. Yeah. Yeah, so this entire spending time and then um, commitment, so to speak, that's a big part of it. And also um, novelty. So the fact that you can expect a certain outcome, there's a certain amount of chance, for example, when you... Um, when you swipe through the candidates, you don't know who's going to come next. So this calculated surprise element, um, we also use that to ah, yeah, okay. to shake things up a little bit. That's cool. Yeah, so you don't know who's going to be next, or you don't know which candidates are going to be in the front of the race, or which ones are going to be thrown out dramatically. That's always a little, little surprise that pops up. Interesting. Do you also work on um, different contract work within your company or is it that one project that you spend most of your time in? Both of these uh, are true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so actually Project CH Plus takes up most of our time, especially because we're all just part-time working, right? So we have limited resources at the moment. Um, but we do also take on contract work mm -hmm. and right now we're really in the in the social sphere. So we have some fair trade projects going on. Um, really, democracy education at the moment is the core focus, and um, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds good. But um, in general, like, how do you build games for education? Where do you usually start? I assume that comes with a lot of research that you also have to do. But what's from your point of view? Where do you start? Um, in educational games, I think the biggest challenge is to not only make it entertaining but also educational at yeah. the same time so you need to understand the subject matter so if we do a math game for example you would have to understand the math that you're <laughs> trying to teach and then you also need to understand the difficulty that students or users would have in learning this math mm -hmm. um, um, system problem uh, and uh, so these are the two things. You need to understand the subject matter and then you need to understand the difficulty of the target audience. And then, of course, um, you need to add crazy ideas <laughs> to um, make it entertaining. Yeah. And they're really just think outside of the box and mix in the game mechanics as soon as you possibly can. Okay, like yeah. Yeah, the, the worst mistake that you could make is um, thinking about... Um, the the math problem and then in the end be like okay and now you get five points if you did it correctly <laughs> so that's well. like yeah um, yeah we actually call that the the chocolate covered broccoli oh yeah if you just make broccoli which is the math problem and then you <laughs> slap game mechanics on top of it which just is the, the chocolate, chocolate it's not it's not great it's like not you need to best. you need to mix the ingredients from the start and then it's gonna turn out awesome in the end Oh, I love that reference, actually. Yeah, I think this is something in general that comes up a lot, where you really notice that people are making games and they have one core idea, but then they want to m make it more fun in a way. And then they slap some mechanics on top of it and you can really tell that these don't yep. really fit together yep. and they don't like complement each yep. other, but rather are, you know, in a little conflict more. So uh, I could also see that people make um, serious games or educational games and in the end the, the game mechanic is more fun than to actually connect it to what you're supposed to learn, right? So that's, that's also hard yep. to then really bring back the focus onto the matter. So yeah, I mean in general I think that making educational games is, is really a challenge um, and oftentimes it's probably more um, complicated to define your target audience as well, right? To then understand who am I making this game for? Yes, and there is also one thing you forgot, which is <laughs> usually um, <laughs> learning new skills. I don't know what's wrong with society, but we have that associated with s being stupid. Because like you're oh, yeah. in school and you're forced to learn new stuff and it's difficult. Yeah. So a learning game already starts off often, <laughs> and I also get that from the games industry, starts off with like, ugh, a learning game, oh my god, I no, learn no, <laughs> like, oh, it's about history, that's lame, like from the get-go you have this bad image in your head. So that's also something that I think the industry needs to advance in order yeah. to get that out, because really a good educational game is supposed to be 
fun? Yeah, really, like really, if it's not fun, then it's, it's not successful. But it's also supposed to be educational at the same time. And there, I think there's important to make a difference between uh, serious games, like really full on games that are educational yeah. and gamifications. So that's where you take game mechanics outside of the game context like a Fitbit or something mm -hmm. like that where you just get your di uh, your daily high score and um, what is it analysis of your stats and stuff like that um, so that's two really different things and I think there is a place for both of these and I'm act personally I'm really excited to see where the industry goes with this yeah but I think that's right you're saying that there is a lot of prejudice for serious games or educational games that they are just boring that this is just a lot of text for example this is something that Often I hear a lot it is, yeah. yeah but you can also you know I think make that quite interesting to bring the text into your game in a non text only way if you yeah know I, mean. I think that's actually it's also um, a funding problem Oh, yeah. Because if you have a, an entertainment game and you have a community who buys this because they love playing it, that's like you got a lot of cash flow that comes in there. Or like, I don't know, <laughs> uh, if we're at microtransactions, ew, like you get a lot of cash flow in there um, with entertainment mechanics. And with educational games, it's like, where do you get the money from? Yeah. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to talk to institutions, um, you need to talk to schools, to educators to get the first funding in. Because no one is going to be super hyped, oh well, very small amount of people <laughs> is going to be super hyped about the next physics game out there. So yeah, there's there um, will be an audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah there will be an audience. It's yeah. not the same uh, amount of people that would, you know, cry and run to the store to get the next GDA, for example, right? So it's very different what you have to deal with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, is there anything specific in your studies that came up which inspired you or, or influenced you the most to make these types of games and build up your company? Yeah, that was actually in my bachelor education, mm -hmm. so in the Netherlands. Um, my bachelor thesis was about a museum game that would introduce museum narratives to children before they yeah. would visit the museum. and. Um, while I was doing research on educational games and motivational design, I was coming across a lot of literature on how to build habit building applications, mm -hmm. uh, motivational triggers and motivational design stuff to keep people engaged. And I was sitting there like, I mean, that's cool, but isn't it also kind of messed up? Because kind you're of manipulative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that really got me thinking and then I was I was like yeah okay so if this knowledge is out there how to make habit building applications how to set notification triggers that people will most likely check your application then we have to use them for educational purposes mm -hmm. because they're being used anyway so at least I want to use them also to convey skills knowledge stuff like that yeah yeah so to utilize them in a more ethical way, you could say. So if you want to put it like that, yeah. Yeah, maybe in general. So um, I think that you're uh, faced with many ethical questions in general when you're developing and when you're talking to your team and so on. And um, the term has fallen before, which is, uh, was uh, ethical design. Maybe you can explain a little bit what, in your opinion, is ethical design. Yeah, it's. Um, really what we just touched on briefly, it's about using the existing knowledge on digital media, social media, entertainment media, mm -hmm. and using that in order to empower people to achieve their own goals, to think about their own, I don't know, questions in life. So mm -hmm. I really like to, to turn it into an introspective thing instead of using these mechanics to make people buy something or spend time on your platform. It's about um, intrinsic motivation for something that they want. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really big thing. And it's very relevant for our um, society at the moment where we consume a lot of stuff that for is sure. highly designed to be engaging, addicting, if we're looking at social media. Um, so yeah, ethical design is raising awareness I think for me like talking to people about it but then using this knowledge to support people in yeah really their own reasoning 
self-determination. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so basically use the tools that we already have and we are also as users seeing every day, but then put them in a different context a little bit sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also interesting in general to look at when you're making games. What are things that you see over and over again, but in different contexts? And you maybe don't realize it before, but then you're like, oh, this is a pattern that I've seen before. And then you kind of like have this epiphany moment where you, oh, this is why I wanted to do this. Yeah. Or this is why I was uh, motivated to go forward with this. Um, yeah, and we got a question by uh, Lannis Tan, which is also something that I wondered before, because you said, okay, funding uh, is very complicated. In general, mm -hmm. there's not like um, lots of pots where you can get money from. And I think in general, in Germany, for example, with the game development, it's not greatly funded mm. yet. Um, and I think in Switzerland, it's not <laughs> so different. <laughs> but um, how are your projects funded? Like, yeah. where do you get your money from? I have friends who would like start uh, spe uh, spewing fire right <laughs> now because of how games are funded in Switzerland. I, see. I think there I'm actually lucky that I work in educational games ah, and okay. there's actually from my experience there's quite some interest in that. Okay. Um, especially since we are explicitly doing democracy projects. That's our main focus. And in Switzerland we have a lot of institutions that support projects like that and um, so we go to foundations and we go to who well, I actually don't know the English word for it, like Gemeinnützig, um, Common Good Foundations. <laughs> yeah, um, non-profit. Yeah, yeah, like they're definitely yeah. non-profit but um, they just support projects that are supposed to do something good. Yeah. And we go to those kind of foundations yeah. and um, yeah, so far that has worked out really well. We've actually also gotten money from a, a state innovation program. Mm -hmm. For us, it's always really important that we don't take like political money, so we yeah. cannot go to parties and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, that would also give out the wrong image, I yeah, assume. Yeah, like no, 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 no. Funded by and yeah. then <laughs> name of political party. No, totally not okay. Yeah. But yeah, foundations. Um, mm -hmm. Do you also... Um, think about working with publishers sometimes, like which is a common way to to work with publishers in uh, other games, entertainment games. Um, but is that also something that you would use for your project? At the moment, not at all actually, mm -hmm. because really we have this, uh, we have the public sector. Yeah. Um, and then we do some contract work also in this field of public interest um, and society supporting. And publishing, I'm actually not sure because in educational games often you have a client so you would work together with an educational institution and that would be covered. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably different if you make um, a serious game that is, you're trying to get that off the ground without a specific client. Um, but we haven't tried that so far, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, we got another question from the chat from um, Effie. 1893. I just spoke about this earlier that I have this number switch thing and I think I said that I'm correct. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in they said maybe this has already been answered but could Sophie explain the term co-design? Oh yeah. Um, co-design is about involving your players, your end users throughout the entire design process. So you don't just give them the designs that you made as you usually do with user testing, um, you really involve them from the get-go. So you're like, okay, uh, for example, in, in the election um, apps that we're doing, it's like, okay, there's elections, there's, what is your problem, first of all? Yeah. And then I just ask them, okay, this is your problem, how do you fix it? And ah. then, yes, so we do workshops as well, and then their task is really, how would I build a parliament insight trust building application cool where i can see what parliamentarians are doing yeah and then um, they have time to come up with their own concepts and when then we discuss them in a group so core design is really about involving players users um, from the get-go and actively giving them the power to decide stuff so mm -hmm. they can decide new features um, with our uh, the ch plus app they could actually decide the color scheme of the <laughs> application so it's it's small stuff to integrate them in the development process. And it's a lot of fun. You give up some of the control because, um, yeah, 
they were able to choose the color mm -hmm. scheme. Oh yeah, actually, I hated the color they chose. <laughs> <laughs> I hated the How color they chose. Them? <laughs> <laughs> but we did it anyway. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. You gotta be careful with the choices <laughs> that you give people. Um, it's a little bit like in Kickstarter campaigns, where yeah. then people can at some point choose something, and the yeah. developers are like, "This is what you chose." Yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that is very interesting. I was wondering, how do you how do you find these people to work with? Like, is it just an open call, or do you have a casting for that, or how does it work? Both. Okay. So we always do online surveys. Mm -hmm. They're not always super popular, so we have sometimes we have rounds where there's like hundreds of people who reply. Actually, we have one that where there was two. That was really <laughs> embarrassing, but we always make a mix. So we have surveys that are accessible online, and then we have test groups. We have workshops, and for the for the workshops, we usually go to schools or educational institutions, and for the testings. Actually, let me think how we did that. I think <laughs> I was. Um, at uh, different conferences and then you start talking to people and then you like specifically invite yeah. specific people also with us because we know they're from the canton where we're going to go next ah, so yeah that's that something that we have to look for as well i understand um and then maybe this is this is more design heavy question i think but um i am I actually think it's very interesting to look at this a little bit more, which is um, I could imagine that when you're building um, an educational application or game um, that you are making this for people that are not casual gamers, that don't really play a lot of other games, that don't really know about many mechanics that you would say, oh, this is, I've seen that in plenty of games. I've done that multiple times and so on and so on. So do you have to also keep that in mind when you're building your mechanics that you s maybe have to mm, explain them from a very basic level in order that they people understand or is that more like you don't really use that type of mechanics because they would already be too complex for what you want to convey yeah i mean we're definitely targeting casual players if yeah. you will um but we're also targeting digital natives yeah so we are trying to use things that people are familiar with um, your uh, reward systems scrolling drag and drop gestures i mean it, it really starts with the basic stuff yeah um unlocking mechanics things like that most digital natives are familiar with that yes it's funny sometimes older people who try our application <laughs> they get stuck in really weird places but then um yeah we keep in mind target audience and yeah, a sixty-year-old person are not not the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, and I would also wonder, like, when you were uh, living in all of these different countries, um, when was the time when you decided, okay, now I would really want to start and do my own thing? Like, when when did that happen, especially for you? Like, you talked about a little bit what was your motivation at the time when you did your bachelor and so on and so on, but then were you working before in a different firm, for example, or in a company, or did you start off right away? I jumped into the ice cold water nice. and learned swimming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I was never interested in working in a big, big company. Mm -hmm. that wouldn't I don't know I don't see the the thrill of it there probably is but to me I mean there wasn't a company that was doing exactly what I wanted to do yeah and um, I always knew that I wanted to do something with educational games and when the the opportunity came to continue my master's project that was also like obviously that just didn't just fall into my lap like I had to <laughs> apply for the grants the first grant and when that came I just went all in yeah I think that's very brave of you as well I mean it's nothing that you can just like pull off like that it, it really takes a lot of effort and and work to do that so congratulations to you and your team for this I think Thank this you. is really important to also highlight that um, do you think um, that it is um, also complicated for you as a like female dominated team to be in this market would you say that there is like 
a good mix of diversity or would you think that there is really a more heavy-sided male domination? What do you think? Um, so I've never worked in plain entertainment games. Yeah. From what I have observed, <laughs> I think that educational games are a bit more, there's a bit more women in that area. Yeah. Um, so I've always been happy about the environment. I don't think, like serious games, it's not toxic at all. If somebody hates on you, it's because <laughs> you made the chocolate covered broccoli, <laughs> but it's not like, oh, your, your character looks ugly, or I, <laughs> I don't know what. I hate you, <laughs> <like> <laughs> that. Um, So we've, we haven't had any issues with the man-woman ratio situation. No. That, that is really good to hear. Yeah. Actually, maybe this is something that the entertainment industry can then like learn from the educational side of game development. Yeah, I'm. I mean, learn. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's just a different. Um, it's a different field, and it's a different focus. So our focus really is not 100% on making the coolest looking building or character yeah. or special effect. It's really about making learning something as awesome as possible yeah and people who care about that it's also probably a community thing people yeah. care about learning stuff <laughs> they might not be uh, that hung up on the uh, character model uh, yeah. of a character in the game yeah yeah but there again i never worked in plain entertainment games yeah i mean i think that is something very true that you touched upon which is um just in general, that the community is just so different and yeah. the community engagement is also very different. Like, I work um, in an entertainment game industry and uh, there I can really tell like when the art style of something has changed, um, then the players are really heavily opinionated mm. on this. But this is nothing that really happens with educational games, I assume, because you know, you're all still learning what you wanted to yeah. learn and the framework around it is working or it's not working, right? So when you're doing chocolate <laughs> covered broccoli, <laughs> then it's quite obvious that something is wrong, but yeah. it's not so, um, in my opinion, this is a chocolate covered broccoli, then it, it just is, yeah. And it's also just more appreciative of the approach. I think mm -hmm. in many educational games, also in like conferences, it's like, oh, somebody is trying to find a solution of how yeah. to do this in a cool way. And then you're like, yay, you're awesome. You're trying to <laughs> solve something and like you're, you're on your journey there. Um, I also really like that aspect of, of the educational game industry in general. I think we're excited about successful approaches more than we are angry about unsuccessful approaches yeah. or ugly character models. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you can change that. Like what? <laughs> That's true. It's actually very, very nice. I, I think that when your community appreciates you and also your colleagues from the same field can also appreciate you and share knowledge without having this uh, constant thought of competition yeah, is also definitely. something that yeah. is really boosting yeah. that industry as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we did get another question um, from uh, Madeline, which is, uh, did you study at the University of Arts of Zurich? Or did uh, or how did the cooperation come together? Because there is a cooperation with yes. the University of Arts. Maybe exactly. you can share that a little bit. Yeah, I did my masters at the Zurich University of mm -hmm. the Arts. I had fantastic professors, nice. like really very very inspiring people. Mela and Rene, you're amazing, and <laughs> I'm still very thankful that you are around and looking at the project from time to time. Uh, the game design department there is awesome. I think they really help people to think outside of the box. Um, so yes, I did my master's there. I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm very glad that I got this opportunity to continue with them. Yeah. yeah. And they also helped, of course, with the setting up the spin-off and everything. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And um, what are, are the projects that you're working on currently with the um, SHDK yeah. at the moment for the people that don't know? Yeah, it's uh, Project CH Plus. Perfect. Like Project CH Plus is the big thing, and yeah. then we have the spin-off, and over the spin-off, we're trying to get in like additional contract work. That's really nice. Yeah. Cool that you also have the a university in yeah. the back, which is also supporting you and your company. That's really nice. Yeah. 
Um, what is something that you're excited about in the future to come? What is something that you would like to work at or work on in the future, maybe like a project that you would like to be involved, a topic that you would like to build something around? Is there anything? Yes, actually, <laughs> I've had this dream for a while now, and it's a triple A budget game. Oh, science fiction, but it actually teaches you chemistry and physics. Oh, yeah, like one day in my dreams. And yeah, mm. that's really because science fiction is amazing. And the cool thing is, like nowadays, we can do so many awesome things already. Sometimes I'm like, you do you still need like science fiction? Because there's so much awesome stuff that exists. So we just got to show that. So yeah, sci-fi game, AAA budget, wait for it. And <laughs> where did your love for uh, physics and chemistry come from? Was it there already or is it something that you learned recently about? I think that's where we get back to the whole moving around mm -hmm. all the time. I love understanding how the world works because the world is amazing. Like the different animals that exist, the different nature that's out there, the cultures that established themselves like we have all ki different kinds of tribes and norms and whatever not and it's amazing how this all came to be and sometimes i really think science it's like magic it's in a it way really is yeah i mean it was treated like religion uh, and magic for a very long time yeah. so i do think it has a lot of similarities as well also how people view it. Um, and you talked about your love for science fiction. Um, what do you love about science fiction? <laughs> um, well, I, I do like Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Of course, because we have this entire fantasy aspect of it, exploring the galaxy, seeing new life forms. But also it's, I think Star Trek especially is like a future that I would personally want to live in, like with their value system and all of that. I think they're, they've been quite on point. They've always been very progressive and I appreciate that. Um, science fiction in general, I think it's exactly this border that fascinates me. It's reality and what is really possible and then where it could go next. Yeah. But a little bit with reality in there sometimes, yeah. not always, but sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like oftentimes um, we as humans kind of stand in our own way uh, or stand in the way of progress because we're a little bit afraid of letting go things and values that we've lived with and learned over many years and then trying to move on from that. So I would love to see actually how more people are less afraid of learning something new and then maybe also realizing, wow, this is super science fiction, but maybe it doesn't have to be. So yeah, I think this is something which we will definitely see or hopefully see more of in the future. Um, but yeah, so um, it, when is the next big uh, like update coming for your application? Is there a new election coming up? Yes, in autumn, we're actually in the Canton Zug. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the first time we're developing features that are useful on the national level. So, so ah. far, we've really been focused on elections and helping people who to choose for, for their local government. And next year, we have the big, big federal elections where all of Switzerland, we, we vote for our uh, national parliament. And it's actually, that's where we started. So in 2019, the first surveys about how to make this voting application, that was during the last federal elections. Mm -hmm. So next year, four years later, there is the next batch coming up. And for that, our goal is to have um, our two apps ready so that people get support in their um, voting decision. But then after they voted, they should be able to see how these people now behave in parliament. Ah, yeah. yeah. So that's the next step that we're currently working on, not just making it engaging on that's cool. getting to know people, but then also seeing, okay, I voted for you, you made it. So what now what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're really excited about that. I think this is something in general that really uh, is a huge topic for many voters that are like, okay, but I voted for you because you said this and that, and yeah. now you're really not doing yeah. that at all. So how come? And um, yeah, maybe reassuring also the voters to be like, no, your voice actually matters and we will listen to what you wanted from yeah. us. So that's really, really nice approach, I think as well. We do have another question uh, from Moon Mats, which is, do you have uh, do you have to have studied to work on educational games uh, or do you have any tips for people who would like to join your team? 
Um, I think you never need to have studied <laughs> to uh, get in to a place where you really want to be. Um, something that's really important for us specifically is that you like you're interested like if you're not super skilled because you just um, finished your education we want to see the talent so it's about the motivation behind it the fascination with learning so if you want to be in, in educational games and make sure that people can see that you are interested in knowledge yeah learning stuff discovering stuff um, thinking about the future thinking outside of the box is important and then um, everything that you can do to show that you're a raw diamond like you <laughs> don't need to be polished you just need to you need to be there you need to be ready for it i mean oftentimes i assume that there are also challenges that come along the way that you cannot be prepared for yeah. but then also be willing to tackle these challenges right is something that possibly is also something that is necessary in game development in general but i i really like your answer here because i do also believe that you don't really need to study anything um, in order to um, you know get where you want to be but it's oftentimes helpful right when you don't know where to start like specifically uh, in game development when you really have no idea how games are made and you just really like to play games and I think it's a good start for you just to learn more about it in general but it's not a necessity I would actually like to add to that because I just thinking of it two people in our team um, they didn't study what I hired them for. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> we have a programmer who studied biology mm -hmm. and um, we have a 3D artist who also <laughs> studied biology. Nice. And um, yeah, they had a portfolio. Yeah, they had a portfolio. And that was all that was necessary. Portfolio and then, of course, the interest in educational yeah, applications. Sure. Wasn't even games, actually. Just, yeah. 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 I mean, this is also something that you oftentimes see that also the games industry is quite welcoming to people that come from somewhere else because we have like this nice thing that all skills are kind of needed yeah. in a way and whatever knowledge you bring in it's just beneficial actually for the end product I guess um, so maybe this is something this is still the question but uh, maybe I wanted to ask you do you have things that you do outside of your work to keep you inspired and to keep your to drive you know do you have things that you do we talked about uh, the <laughs> meditation before yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> meditation is actually pretty nice um, yeah I do that that's uh, I enjoy that a lot um, singing and playing instruments is something I enjoy just to clear the brain. I yeah. feel like when you're playing an instrument, there's like, you just go into this Zen mode. I don't know. You mm -hmm. like you're like I play the piano. And my hands just do things. Like, yeah. I don't know. It just happens. And um, yeah, I like to teach myself new stuff. Like at the moment, I'm trying to learn how to growl and how to scream. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Without hurting my vocal cords. Oh, what are you saying? That's yeah, like yeah, the exactly. real that's challenge. That's exactly the thing. And it's, it's absolutely hilarious. It's because like you, in order to do it correctly, you need to dare to make embarrassing noises. Because yeah. in the beginning, like you don't know how to do this without actually screaming. And that's a lot of fun. And it's also really cool when you notice that you're improving. Yeah. And, and how, how do you learn that? Like with <laughs> the coach or with <laughs> videos or... Have you heard of the YouTube University? <laughs> I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I attended myself. You attended yourself. Oh, that's quite yes. delightful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, really YouTube. But you have to be careful, obviously, because there's a lot of potatoes. Yeah. On now that they remove the dislike, uh, it's also yeah, hard yeah, to yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think for your voice, a good indicator is always if it hurts, you just stop yeah. immediately. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Um. And do you also do something like sometimes with your team where you do team building exercises or you go for a walk together or, you know, have a brainstorm outside or something like that? Yeah, in the very beginning, we actually did a game jam together. Cool. Yeah, that was to start off like the initial team, like people left after that. Um, but it, it's really important to, yeah, get to know each other mm -hmm. and just hang out sometimes without working. Yeah, 
And one thing that we're planning to do is going to the Europa Park. Oh, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, very important. <laughs> and then you also go to Switzerland in the Europa Park and <laughs> go to the Schweizer Bobbahn, which <laughs> I've been <laughs> plenty of times. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that's also um, a good thing to keep in mind, right? And all of you different people bring different values to your project in the end as well. And it's also good to have like these differentiations between the different people on your team. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, when you communicate with other people from your sector that do educational games, do you sometimes have the feeling that they are also um, doing that because they want to bring change or do you also sometimes see people that just want to hop on the educational <laughs> <games train laughs> as well yes <laughs> i see both yeah i see both um especially when it comes to gamification there are some people out there like they think gamification is the solution for everything <laughs> and if you ever meet someone who says they have the solution for everything you run, <laughs> you run far and you run fast because that's not <laughs> how this works. That's not how any of this works. Um, so yes, there are people who just really want to be like, oh, I have this perfect business solution for your entire HR management and it's gamified, ha ha. <laughs> um, so easy, <laughs> yay. <laughs> no, um, that definitely exists, but I'm very happy that educational games, from my experience, is really an industry where people try to change something to teach something maybe it's a bit nerdier like yeah yeah but it's it's there's a lot of honest uh, willingness to teach yeah. that's really cool yeah i think that also makes sense to then work with academic institutions right and to bring that behavior into schools as well uh, and you know show that you don't only have to um, work in games or um, software and applications to make entertainment but you can also use your skills like you did you studied game design in a very traditional kind of way of course in your university as you said it had a little bit more of a um, topic mm. about educational games but it's interesting that you can you know do that when you're passionate about something and you want to change some things well I think that's really interesting did you also um, think about um, bringing your learnings from your application now to um, other democratic countries that also could benefit from your program? Um, I think because it's a very delicate topic, like you really don't want to mess with democracy in the wrong way. And we are really researching from the bottom up how to develop something that supports voters in Switzerland. Yeah. So this is not going to work in other countries. Yeah. Like if we just take this, we put it into a different country, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, maybe in the future, starting different projects customized to different countries um, would be an option. But really our first big goal is to make something awesome until the next federal elections. Yeah. 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 I think that's very, that's a very good point. And maybe sometime in the future you could like function maybe a little bit like a consultancy where other developers that also want to do something similar like you do can come with questions and be like hey we noticed this and that and you'd be like ah we noticed something similar maybe you can try out this and that where again then this hive mind comes a little bit into play definitely like if people from germany or whatever country you're listening and watching from if, if you're interested in pushing democracy in your level with uh, playful solutions, message me. <laughs> like, I'm all for it. Democracy is amazing and whatever I can do, man. It's not a lot, but something. Like, we all can do something. Right? Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and besides your love for science fiction and um, <laughs> science, in that case, uh, is there also another topic within your team that sometimes arises that you kind of bump ideas of each other or um, not so much at the moment? I mean, two people studied biology, mm -hmm. so there's there's that. Um, other than that, one developer is interested in teaching itself, yeah. so he wants to use a part-time teacher. Um, but like, because we're really like 
at capacity <laughs> with Project yeah. TH Plus <laughs> and only our two working days at the moment and then also some other small projects um, for the company itself. At the moment, or unfortunately, we don't have time yeah. for our own concepts. Like Maybe yeah. someday yeah. You, you do. Yeah, It's good to have something in mind that you can think about what you just like to think about. So I think that's, that's enough for the moment, I guess. Um, yeah, it's already also an hour that passed. Um, I don't know. Do we have any more questions from you, audience, from the chat? Is there anything else you would like to ask, Sophie? Because we do have some time for questions, um, if you have some. Um, otherwise, I would, you know, keep asking you questions. But if anything <laughs> else uh, comes up, then feel free to drop them in the chat as well. Um, yeah, I was wondering, because you said that you moved around so much. Do you, how many languages do you, do you speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually embarrassing, because the secret is that everywhere you can speak English. It's true. <laughs> it's like, so, so true. So I think if you throw me in a cab in these countries, I could still find my way home. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, I speak German, French, English, and Dutch. I think yeah. that's still quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so but my Arabic's gone. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah mine too. <laughs> so, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> no, um, but yeah, did you uh, ever check out, for example, like language learning applications that also go into the direction of gamification? Yeah, I think Duolingo is very famous. Yes, that's yeah. true. So, I actually used that to learn Dutch mm -hmm. at some point. Like, they didn't quite get my level right, so it was always too easy for me, and then I stopped. Um, but yeah, Duolingo is the one that I used, so that was that was nice. Yeah. And uh, do you also use um, other applications for different topics in your, in your life that you can recommend, where you see, oh, actually, this is an educational application that is useful? I think this is actually the sad part, because... Um, <laughs> There's a lot of cool educational stuff for a younger audience, but the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to mix um, knowledge into something like easily digestible, so to speak. So playful applications for like high level knowledge, mm -hmm. like, at, like you learn at university or something like that, is very rare to find. Something that I did enjoy, I'm not sure if you want to call it an educational game, is Plant Nanny. So you can um, you monitor how much you drink and you you always water a little plant ah every yeah, time I you drink. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, yeah, that's very wonderful. And one example that I really love, it's not for our age group, but um, I think it's a very good example of playful teaching is Dragon Box. Oh. Yeah, that's a mobile app that teaches algebra. Oh. And it's absolutely amazing because it starts off with just pictures. And then after like two hours, you're able to solve equations that like it's crazy cool and it's it's such a slow and steady process that you don't even notice that the pictures get swapped out with numbers and letters ah that, that yeah. is so nice when you can really then also tell okay i actually understand this so i took something with it yeah friends of mine are currently working on um a game which is uh also teaching the people how to code which i mm. find also super interesting because it's just like this this is like this fourth wall for me a little bit because you need to code in order to make the game work mm. and then you code inside the game to make the game work even worse. So that's also something which I like a lot. Yeah. And they do have lots of, you know, na natural uh, game mechanics in that you can farm and you can talk to NPCs and all that kind of stuff that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, education in that kind of sense. But then you always have to go back to that particular educational factor within their game um, to progress which is like it's a it's a natural loop which I like a lot and That's I think cool. um, that is something that we can probably also see a little bit more in the future because like I've seen a couple of indie games coming up <laughs> that uh, play with that thought a little bit more so maybe at some point there will be a little bit more of an overlap between ed entertainment games yeah. industry and then like maybe consulting or however form it will take on um, to then educational games industry. Yeah, is there anything else that you would give someone on their way that's like, ah, man, this is really inspiring. I would love to do educational games as well. Like, 
any tips, tricks that you would put out there besides being interested and being f uh, fierce, <laughs> maybe? Um, have a look at Jane McGonagall. Um, she is like a, she has a very strong vision of what playful approaches can do for society. And other than that, um, talk to teachers, actually. Mm -hmm. Talk to educators, because the game design is one aspect of it. But I think at this stage we're currently at, it's more important to have a bridge or be the bridge <laughs> between educators and game designers. Yeah. Yeah. Take their learnings, because they're teaching yeah. every day, uh, as well into account. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because many game designers, they can teach great mechanics, maybe not so well the teaching itself. So yeah. Okay, I think this is uh, it for us right now. But if people still want to reach out to you, they can still find you on your website, right? And um, reach out to you three, uh, via Mirror Looks creations and um, find you online then and ask many questions. However, any questions, yes, <laughs> whatever still comes up. So I want to say thank you so much for participating. It was a very inspiring story, in my opinion, and I'd love to see what else you're going to create in the future. Thank and you. I'm excited Likewise. to have a look at that. And thank you all very much for joining us as well. Thank you for joining in us. Studio. Thank you to the team. And maybe we will also see each other the next inspiring stories or at an actual Womanize event, physical event. Let's see. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And Likewise. yes, I hope to see you next time and have a great evening, everyone.